Yeah, this remind me. Oh, I don't know, did I? Oh yeah, it's a recording already. Okay, any, any other question before we start? Will the midterm be the whole class or will it be one hour? And is there like something which is no additionally related what, to the midterm? What, what's your question? Will the midterm be like two hours, one hour? What, no, two hours. Be? I mean, the two, whole... two hours, right. Yeah, and yeah. how many questions will there be in the midterm? Oh, I, I don't remember. <laughs> I mean, I usually it's like a five question or something. Or okay. sometimes like a multiple choices. Okay. So they're, they're sufficient. I mean, it's a, it's a substantial, I have to say. It's not like a quiz. So it's a dedicate the whole, whole class. It's the same thing for the final. Any other question? Oh, I noticed that there are a couple of undergraduate students, right? Uh, can you tell me what's the reason you take this class? Because you want to do graduate work or what? Uh, yeah, I'll go first. I'm doing a, a plus one program. So starting next year, I'll be an undergrad and graduate enrollment. So I'm getting an undergraduate in CS and a master's in data oh, yeah. science. It's acceler acceleration program. Yeah. Yeah. But you already taken all this data structure and all that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that, that makes sense. So that basically you're kind of graduate student already. Okay, let's uh, get started. So this is a cover of the textbook. Uh, if you don't have the book, I will strongly suggest that you purchase the book or you borrow the book from the library. Although I post all my uh, notes uh, on the website. Right? And that's the outline. And we already discussed that. Right? So we don't need to go through that. Uh, let's uh, first uh, talk about what's the algorithm. Right? So there are many definitions. So in a simple way, if you look at the website uh, dictionary, so it's a procedure for solving a mathematical problem. It's a mathematical problem in a finite number of steps that frequently involve repetition of an operation. So it's just step-by-step -step problem solving. Right? So Noose is a famous uh, professor, Turing Award winner at Stanford. So in his book, he defined algorithm as a finite, definite, effective procedure with some input and output. So it's very important. Give you a problem, what's the input, and then expect some output, some result. So this part, uh, the bottom part is just someone said that uh, if you write a good algorithm, it's like a poem, right? So if you're artist, so it, it looks so very nice. And then the, the history, little history. So actually, surprisingly, algorithm come from uh, Arabic. Uh, it really means that the process of uh, doing arithmetic using Arabic numerals, numerals. So the true origin is uh, there is a famous mathematician, although I don't know how to uh, announce. So fortunately, we have an Iranian uh, student here and she can uh, volunteer. So Nadia, you may want to Turn on your microphone. And uh, you want to say? Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, his last name is uh, Khorazmi. And uh, this is because he was born in Khoraz. Uh, Khoraz was part of Iran, but uh, unfortunately, uh, now it belongs to partly uh, Pakistan and uh, Uzbekistan. But uh, Khwarezmi uh, is a famous people in Iran uh, because uh, we have a lot of academic institutes uh, which is called Khwarezmi uh, University, college, and uh, so on. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, his name is very long, like Abdul, uh, yeah. Anam, Muhammad, but that's really Yeah, easy. but the last name is Khwarezmi. Oh, Harazi. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So he's he's basically the ninth uh, century uh, Persian uh, mathematician. Actually, the old algebra, like a uh, middle school algebra. So so he he come up with this solution. So the, the, this word I don't know. I think that means uh, algebra, algebra, right? So it's, I think is that's algebra. Yeah. So high school algebra, and he's very well known. Actually, I. I found it on the website. So this is a stamp uh, issued by the Soviet Union, 1983. 
to mark the 1,200th one birth anniversary. So, so it's interesting, so you, you know that uh, he's like a, the true origin of algorithm um, algebra. Little history. So this class, uh, remember the title of the class called Design and Analysis of a Computer Algorithm. So it's not just design. And lots of students will say, oh, I know how to code in you C or Java, so it should be easy. No. You will see, uh, I'll give you some uh, sample example. You see that uh, design is not that easy. And you may come up with uh, a, a solution, but may not be efficient. So what we focus is on how to design efficient or optimal algorithm. And uh, some students will say, oh, now the computer is very fast. Even if it's not that efficient, we can still solve it. Uh, in reality, it's not. When the problem size increase, uh, you may not be able to finish uh, the program. Analysis is also very important. How do you know that your algorithm is efficient? So we, we need a mathematical analysis to see the complexity. Right? So this is the, what we're going to cover, as I briefly mentioned earlier. So we will discuss uh, several techniques, basically the four basic one called greedy, divide and conquer, dynamic programming, network flow. So these are the like problems that uh, tractable means that you, you can find uh, a polynomial solution. Right? So relative for simple. Obviously finding the optimal solution may not be simple. That's what we try to do. And there are some problem that's very difficult called the MP complete. Means that uh, so far we don't haven't find any uh, polynomial solution. So we call this computational intractability. So what we're going to do when you see a problem that cannot be solved efficiently, are we stopping there? No, we try to find an approximation solution, right? So the whole class, since this is a graduate class, we're going to do a relative far pace. So we focus on critical thinking, very important, critical thinking, problem solving. So that's what we focus mainly on the pseudocode solution, not uh, programming, right? So you already know C or Java or other. So once you know the pseudocode, you should easy to implement. And the complexity analysis. So critical thinking first, then you try to solve it, and then you analyze the complexity. So we'll go through several examples later. Okay, so let's uh, go on to look at some exciting problems. Uh, you know that this uh, this semester, spring semester, two big events. One is a sports event. Another one is a uh, related to art, uh, Oscar. Right. So let's first look at a, a problem called celebrity problem, Oscar. You know who attend usually attend the Oscar celebration. Usually those are celebrity movie stars, right? So how you define a movie star, celebrity? So this is another important thing. In computer algorithm, we have to define problem very precise, right? very precise. So here we have a precise definition called celebrity. What's a celebrity? Celebrity is someone does not know anyone. So does not care who the other one. Well, everyone knows him or her. You, you may argue, oh, this is kind of extreme, right? So we just have this kind of restricted model or concept called celebrity. So let me repeat again. That person does not know anyone. Well, everyone knows him or her. That's a celebrity. Now I give you the problem. Suppose you have a, a group of people, N, N, say like this class, right? We have a 10, uh, 13 students, yeah, 13 students. I will ask if there is a celebrity among these 13, so now the question is how you solve this problem? You have to give an operation means the primitive. That's very important, like a problem solving. What's the command you can do? The command is simple is that, that you select two people, A and B. Then ask A if he or she knows B. So it's directional. Right? A and B, ask A, do you know B? So it's not bi-directional, bi only directional means ask A, do you know another person B? So this we call the primitive operation. 
So now the question is, what's the complexity of this algorithm? What's the most efficient algorithm to find if there is a celebrity or not? And if there is one, you find it, okay? So this will be like, you can think about this uh, maybe during the break, after the break, I will discuss with you, or maybe some student already find a solution. So this will give a bonus point. I will give a bonus point to student who can solve it. Right? And what's the best way? What's the minimum number of questions you ask to find out if there is celebrity? If there is one, you find one. Cannot be two celebrity, right? Either you don't have any celebrity or there is a celebrity. Another problem related to sports. And we know that uh, Super Bowl, right? Super Bowl will be next month. Right? Do you realize uh, lots of sports uh, uh, like uh, football, basketball, and all that? People only care about champion. They don't care about run up. Right? There's some reason people because only want to care about the best team. If they don't care about the second best. But there are some other thing, uh, interesting things. Is that uh, this related to this question? Suppose all the thing, uh, the strength is transitive, means that, uh, or in reality is not. Reality means that it could be intransitive, means that if A beat B, B beat C, then A beat C, right? That's what we call the transitive. We make a model simple. So that means that each team has a kind of strength, numerical number. Whoever has a higher number, then the, you, you will find this is the best team, right? So the problem is that in the football, right? For example, American football, uh, you, you cannot schedule too many, too many games, right? Right, it's too many, not, not, not too many games. So what you try to do, or even in the soccer is the same. So you have uh, like uh, elimination. It's like uh, also tennis, it's the same. So tennis, really for example, have a eight, 18, you pair to 14, I mean four group, then the winner of this four advance to the next level. Then you have a 14, then you form another two pair. Then the, they have a two winner that the last two will have a game. That's a championship, right? And, uh, then the whoever win the last one is the, the champion. But anyone think about this one? So whichever the team go to the final, that the loser, whether this loser is the real second best or it may not be. Right? So think about this. Uh, oh, I don't know whether, the problem I cannot see myself. Okay. I think that, unfortunately, I don't, uh, if someone can use, maybe I write it here, right? You can hear, you can see, or you cannot see. Can you see yes. it? Yeah. Yeah, you can see it. Huh. So, so basically, oh, I make it a relative simple. Oh, oh, or you can go to another whatever. So you have an 18, right? And uh, you assume this is the, the strongest guy, eventually is a champion. Go up and go up and go up. Then there is another guy is moving from this direction to here. He's a run up, run up, run up. Okay, right now it's a run up. Now the question is, this run up may not be the true run up. Why is that? The reason is that maybe the true run-up is here. The reason is that uh, this run-up got eliminated is because this poor team meet the champion first and get eliminated. Same thing for the tennis, right? So you see that? So this one may not be the real run-up, right? So that's why in the, any kind of sports event, you have elimination, people do not really care too much or the run up get, get some kind of uh, money that's much, much smaller than the champion. The main reason is this run up may not be the true run up. Now, my question is that if you want to find a true run up, 
means that all these things get eliminated. They need to, again, to find the, the second best. What's the minimum number of gain needed? Right? So, so we know that uh, with 18, right? This 18, how many total gain you needed? In fact, you don't need to do calculation. We learned the tree. How many gain? You only need a seven gain. Is it correct? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's a total number of team minus one. So it's a seven. But to find the, the second best team, how many more gain you needed? Okay, so this is another question. And then uh, we can discuss after the break. So is that clear? Yeah. So any, any questions? For that specific example, you said winning can be assumed to be transitive? No, no. It, it's or it's transitive. not. It is transitive. Uh, yeah, we have to assume it's a transitive. Okay. Otherwise, it's intransitive, then it's much more common. That's another problem. We, we'll discuss later. Then if you have in, intransitive, means A beat B, B beat C, C beat A, then who, who is the real winner, right? How you rank those teams? So I have a ranking scheme. So that's another problem. But right now, it's simple. Every team has a strength. It's a numerical number. So it's very, uh, very clear. OK, so, so at least uh, something for you to think about. Now let's uh, look at the more things. Uh, but we're not going to cover this. Uh, the reason I, I uh, discuss this is just to give you a, a, a large scope of this algorithm. You don't get the impression that algorithm just like uh, data structure or program technique where you learn. Actually, there are a wider variety of this algorithm. So the algorithm we focus, most people focus, called sequential algorithm. Really means that they deterministic, you step by step, right? So one, two, three, that's it. But there are many other types. For example, randomized algorithm. So randomized algorithm, they use kind of random selection. Probably everyone knows a quick sort. It means they want to sort a, 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 whatever the list of a number, right? So you remember the quick saw, you randomly pick a, a note, uh, a, a number inside, right? randomly select. This is like a reference point. Then the, you divide the number into two groups, either larger or smaller. So that's kind of random. Right? So we look at the other example of randomized algorithm. And surprisingly, sometimes the randomized algorithm perform better than deterministic algorithm, okay? Then another one, I think all of you learned the sorting algorithm. You learned the sorting probably start from the beginning, right? Introduction to computer, data structure, program technique, or C or Java, all, everyone talk about sorting. Probably never heard this bitonic sort. So bitonic sort is based on a, a mathematical sequence called bitonic sequence. So bitonic sequence really means that you have a sequence of number that start from the small number, they gradually increase to the middle, not really is that middle, then it decrease. So it's by tone, it's first going up and then down, okay? So the professor Ken Batcher invented this algorithm, this like most beautiful algorithm called bitonic sort. Why he invented this one? You know, all the sorting algorithm is sequential, right? So it's a slow. We know that the complexity of sorting algorithm is n log n. When n is a big, suppose you want to sort uh, millions of number. So it'd be very slow, right? Million, million. But if you do it a parallel, parallel means that uh, each line, imagine this each line is, uh, is a person, a person, right? Just a person, or maybe a small computer, small comparator, compare. So their job is very simple. Just each one holds a number, then compare. So each time you compare with one of the other, other number, you do like a pairwise comparison. The arrow line really means that uh, you, the arrow point to from one line to another line means that you put a larger number to the other line, right? So you can see that there's some kind of interesting pattern. The pattern, look at this one first, uh, adjacent to, then you have a group of four, right? Then you have a group of eight. I'm not going to go through this all details. It's like a recursive. 
eventually, when you reach this stage, this sequence become bitonic sequence. Bitonic sequence, what I mentioned earlier, is a number, small number, then increase, then decrease. It's not really sorted. If all increase, then it's sorted, right? Then after this number become bitonic sequence, then they do this kind of very regular kind of pattern comparison. So that means the top half compared with the bottom half in that format. So you, you see that this one you skip of eight, then the next day skip of four and two and one. So after that, uh, if you have a time, you can try right, to see, give it any number, any number, unsorted number. After this stage, this number will all sorted. And it's very fast. How many steps? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten step. So ten step, you can sort uh, 16, 16 number in ten step, very fast. So this is the fastest uh, sorting algorithm, hardware. Right? right? So now you understand? And uh, each line, again, is a hardware, or, or, or as I say, it's a switch, or you can imagine this the people. Like you have a big job, right? So you have lots of people to do it at the same time. And you may not get the linear speed up. It's not a, probably not that simple. You see, oh, if I get the 16 people, so my speed up will be 16 now, because there are lots of uh, inside the synchronization right, overhead. So this actually is the best algorithm if you want to run uh, sorting. So this is just, I want to show you the example of, uh, you can appreciate uh, the importance of uh, parallel algorithm, right? So this actually can spend the whole semester. Uh, in fact, when I was in Freud, I taught this uh, parallel algorithm, which is really interesting, much harder than the traditional sequential algorithm. Then there is a distributed algorithm. Distributed algorithm, what's the difference between distributed and parallel? So distributed also can be do parallel. The difference is that uh, it focus on the delay. Delay really means that uh, imagine that the, you have a, a bunch of uh, a job scattered around whole, all over the world, right? Different parts of the world. So everyone do little bit things and then the output the result. The problem is there's no centralized uh, storage. You have to broadcast to tell everyone. But the problem there is a delay. The delay will cause lots of problems, the consistency and other things, right? So we, everyone knows this blockchain, right? So blockchain is basically is a decentralized system, right? It do all kinds of transactions, but this delay will cause a serious problem. So how you handle those kinds of delay, right? So it's delay sensitive. And if you're interested, I teach uh, distribute uh, system design in another graduate class, right? There are lots of, uh, 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 interesting uh, problem. In addition to this uh, blockchain, there is a famous uh, Byzantine general problem or consensus problem. Right? And there's another one, it's uh, relatively small. That's the one actually I propose called the local algorithm. Local algorithm and uh, suitable for like a social network, right? So everyone now have this kind of social network. Social network means that uh, each person has some kind of friends, local friends, right? So you have a local friends, but the network itself is huge. It's so big. No one actually has a global picture. So how you know your friends, 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 multi-hop. And uh, there are some set of problems that uh, you want to get some kind of algorithm to get some data, but you only have uh, only local information. Can you construct a, uh, uh, and get some kind of result using only local information without even propagation. Right? And uh, you kind of surprise say, oh, how can you solve this kind of problem? In certain problem, we can solve it. Like a connected dominant set we'll mention later. Okay, so this is just a very quick overview. You at least know that there are lots of interesting problems. Okay. Now let's look at, uh, you know, today is a very important day to our presidential inauguration. So in the morning, I watch TV, see the, uh, President Trump left. In the afternoon, then the President uh, Biden will become president. So nowadays, the most challenging debate is about uh, secure voting, right? Secure voting. And the problem with the secure voting is that the 
how do you know that when I vote, someone changed my vote, changed my vote, then there's no way you can even verify, right? Because you put the vote, you put your vote, oh, why there is someone is waiting in the, okay. You put, in your, you put your vote uh, in an envelope. When envelope is open, so you don't have any record. As so you put all the, the ballot in, in one pool, you count. If someone changed your ballot or, or miscalculated, there's no way for you to verify. Believe it or not, just a while ago, maybe 10 years ago, the professor from MIT already invented a secure voting. Actually, it's turned to be very simple. Uh, so what, they, what he proposed, obviously there's some defect, but so everyone voted three, three vote, three ballot, right? So you just imagine that uh, you have a, like a president, you have a three candidates, right? So you vote on the three ballot. If you like a particular person, for example, Biden, you just vote, you, you circle two tickets, right? If you don't want to vote, you circle one. So it's very important. You either select two or you select one. You cannot select three or you cannot select zero. If that, that means this ballot is uh, not the ballot. Okay, so the rule is very simple, right? So everyone will get one circle. The one you really like, get two circle. So why three? Later we'll see it. Then once you vote it, you, you see in the middle line, right? So you take out, you separate these three tickets three tickets. Then you put uh, these three tickets in the, in the, the box, right? So all this will be counted, all three. And you need to keep, you make a, a photo, photo of one ticket. So then as your record, as your record. For example, uh, oh, this is the last one. Oh, why? Oh, yeah, this one. I make a copy of the last one as my proof, as my proof. I keep a copy. Although I still put it there, but I, I make a photograph of mine, right? Then the, the workers collect all this vote and then tally the vote, right? And, and you know that uh, you can really find uh, who is the winner because each person either get two votes or one vote. You just subtract the, the total number of votes, right? And then you, you, you know that the real vote because different, because the one is two, the other one is one. But why you need to separate this? That's the key thing. You separate these things and then you keep a copy of one, right? Then the key thing is that all these tickets, right? Already separate. They will post this ticket on the website, on the website for you to verify. You see that each ticket has a number at the bottom, right? The bottom. So that's the key. If someone change your, your, your vote, so you see that, oh, the, the one I have a copy, you, you, you change. But the, for the, the official, they do not really know which ticket uh, you copy, right? So they, they, they cannot really just change it because you don't really know. They assume that either three can be counted. So that's why they cannot uh, uh, really change your vote. Otherwise, if you get caught, then it's, uh, it's a huge punishment. And there are another important thing is a privacy, very important. Why is the privacy? Imagine you're, you find out that your, your vote has been changed. Then you go to the local office, just show your one vote. The fact that other people see your one vote does not really tell you whether you vote Trump or you vote Biden. Is it correct? Just one ticket you cannot really see. Look at the last ticket of this one. So you have a June, you have one, Smith zero. Doesn't really mean I did not vote Smith. In fact, the other two are voted Smith. <laughs> so in reality is Smith, I voted Smith. So that means you keep your privacy and also you make the, the, the systems secure. Okay. So this is just a very nice algorithm, uh, but this is algorithm for security. Any question? If you're interested, you can just uh, Google and find out this secure voting by Revest. And he's a very smart guy. Probably you know this uh, famous RSA secure uh, 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 crypto uh, protocol, right? RSA. So he's the R. RSA means that uh, uh, 
three, the, the inventor of a three person, the initial last name. So he's the first one reversed. Okay. Any discussion? And actually there are lots of a debate on this kind of voting. And I can spend like weeks to talk about uh, what's a potential issue. Or, but it's a kind of very smart way, right? To, uh, to ensure security and the privacy. Right. So let's uh, look, uh, continue to look at a few more examples. There are lots of many exciting things. Uh, I recently I read uh, two books. One is called Ethical Algorithm. Right. So by our neighbors, two professors from UPenn. So ethical uh, and cover lots of things. One is about privacy, right? and another one is uh, fairness, other things. Let me just look at, uh, give you one interesting example. One example is called uh, like a, uh, a pool. For example, before uh, President Trump left, they have a recent pool, right? Whether you support Trump or you don't support Trump. But right now, how you trust the, the, the poll means that someone call you and uh, you have to really honest, I say, I, I like Trump, or I don't like Trump. But what's the, the issue is that the privacy, right? So now, Really, someone knows that I do not like Trump. So, are there any way you can provide the information, statistically stable information, while without revealing your true intent? Surprising, you can do that. Again, it's a randomized algorithm. Suppose all people are honest. Okay, honest. So, all you need to do is before you answer, you flip a coin. If it's a head, then you tell the truth, okay? If it's a tail, you tell randomly. Random means uh, whatever, zero, one. You like or do not like. Why this privacy is preserved? Because whoever make a phone call cannot really know that whether you truly like President Trump or you don't like it. Is it correct? Because half of chance, is a random number, random, okay? But statistically, you will still derive his approval rate. Think about this one, all right? So actually 75% uh, of time is telling the truth. So you can do this simple statistical analysis and you find that the true uh, approval rate you may not pinpoint to a particular person, but statistically it's accurate. So you see, this is a very nice algorithm, right? It means a randomized algorithm, you keep your uh, privacy, but the globally you get a statistical accurate result. Another type of problem you mentioned about this uh, is called uh, the mechanism design. So it's like a game theory. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, problem. I think I need to draw. Sorry, and again, the only problem I cannot see myself. Oh, is it here? Okay. You can hear. You can see this, right? Okay. So let's. Uh, You see this one, can you see this? So you have a point A and point B. Uh, imagine uh, this one is like a temple university. This is a city hall. Uh, you can uh, uh, go through uh, a, a road, for example, 12th street, 12th street. But the problem with 12th Street is a very narrow, so it, it takes a long time. It's actually a fixed time. Always take, uh, for example, one, you say, uh, just say one hour, right? just one hour. And another road is uh, very fast, just like a broad street, right? It's very wide, it's just like expressway. So obviously everyone, everyone going to go through the broad street. What's the problem of going, everyone go broad street? It's, they get congested. 
right? And just they're getting slower and slower. So this delay X is based on the percentage. Okay, so it means that if 50% of the people go in that one, it takes 0 0.5. If 100%, then you get the, uh, here, right? But still, it will not be worse than the other one. So, so what, what's the result? If there's no control, everyone will go through Broad Street because the worst case is one hour, they say. But what, look, look at the average. What's the average? Average is very bad. Right? If everyone goes that average is one hour, everyone's go one hour. So you see that people are selfish. It's like a game, selfish. But then you get the equilibrium, which is not a very good result. So you need some kind of mechanism design. It will force you to divert the traffic. So really mean if you have a here temple, someone will derail you say that you go this direction, you go that direction. What should be the best proportion? What percentage should go through the 12th street? What percentage you should go through Broad Street? And surprisingly, the result is simple. It's 50 and 50. It means that 50% goes through Broad Street, 50 go. And you get the minimum average delay. Right? So this is a, a, another very interesting uh, thing. Right? So let's uh, go back to So this is the problem we, we mentioned, right? Then the, there's another interesting book called the master's algorithm. So this deal with all the algorithm uh, machine learning, although this is like, uh, we can imagine this extended version of algorithm. In fact, the whole machine learning can think is algorithm to design all the algorithm, right? So it's like a machine learning. So, so the idea is that uh, it just gave you a sufficient amount of data so you can machine learning can come up with some of the solution or, or derive some result. So that's why the uh, Professor Domingo's view, this is a special type of algorithm called master algorithm. Okay? So this is another uh, interesting way of uh, like extension. And there are many, many uh, applications. I'm not going to go through the, all the things, right? So we're going to talk about network, uh, traffic, uh, signal, and the computer graphic later. We'll look at some operational research artificial intelligence, even computational bi uh, biology, means uh, gene matching, and we look at some of this. Right? So we see that all these algorithms will be really useful in practice. Now let's look at some, uh, so the rest of the, this before the break, we'll focus on some interesting really problem and you, you get uh, some favor. The problem we are talking about is about like a matching problem. So dating, searching for the best mate. The first problem we talk about is that uh, suppose you have a sequence of chance to date, right? So eventually your goal is to, for marriage. You, found, you need to find the best person for marriage. And on the other hand, uh, the, what you belong to is some kind of religions which is very conservative really means that the once you married, you're not, you cannot divorce. You stayed for the rest of your life. So your goal is to find the best mate. Okay, well, it looks like a very difficult, right? And give you further restriction. You have to date one by one in sequence, one by one in sequence. And you cannot date a two person at the same time, just one at a time. And after each day before you gave up, you need to decide whether you marry or you give up. All right, so it's, this is actually it's a, uh, like a very realistic problem, right? So, so the problem is this one, give you N candidates. You already know the candidates. One, for example, 10, suppose you have 10, right? 10 candidates. So that means you plan to have a date for 10. And you find a suitable one for marriage. Obviously you mean, because you cannot, uh, uh, a backtrack, that's very important. It means oh, later you find, oh, the, the first one is the best. No, once you decide reject, you reject forever. So this is called the dating sequence. You accept or reject after each date. No more data after acceptance, right? So that means no divorce. Then 
what's the best strategy to find a suitable forum for marriage? Obviously, cannot guarantee you always find uh, the, the best one, but on average, this is the best strategy. So it's a very important, uh, right? So this is called the optimal stopping problem. Mean that you, you, you exam something you want to find out where you should stop, right? So it turned out uh, a very interesting result. We're not going to go through this. I think in the, maybe in the early class cover that. So the best strategy is you divide into two stage it's called phase one and phase two. Phase one, you're not really serious. You just gain experience. You always reject. But you gain experience. So what means gain experience? It really means you remember, suppose each person has some kind of numerical number. Again, I overly simplify, just like a team. So at the first stage, you remember all the person you date, their maximum value. That's the maximum value. That means that the best one so far. Because you don't really know the future and you don't know the quality of the people, right? Well, I assume that the quality of a people, a numerical number is some kind of uniform distribution. Right? So follow, so there is no like a follow specific distribution. Then the, then the second phase, so we, we, we talk about how many people in the first phase. The second phase is that you just start a series. You marry the first person better than all the dates in phase one. So that's you follow a strict rule, two phase, First one, just date, get the experience, get the maximum value. Second one, you just scan the rest of the, the candidate. First one, you just marry, okay? It turns out the best strategy is N divided by E. Is it magic, no, magic, right? E is uh, the famous numbers, 2.71828. So if you have a 10, 10 people, so you divide by E. So this is so-called like a one over E rule means a seven, 30, 37%. 37% really means that uh, like if you, you plan to have a 10 dates, you likely should get serious after four. Or in other way, if you want a 100, you get serious at 37. And not only that, this will prove that this is the best strategy no other strategy can find you the better average result. And the probability of finding the real best one is one over E, which is not bad, right? It's one divided by 2.7, so it's quite high. So this is a very famous problem uh, as optimal stopping. Actually, it's a machine learning uh, later use this kind of concept. And there are lots of extension, for example, what happens if N is unknown? That's much harder. And what happens if you want to have a multiple mates or just say like I have a multiple student, like a professor want to recruit students, right? So interview students or, or uh, recruit the staff. You don't want to just hire one, you want to hire four. So what's the best strategy? You want to get the best average uh, 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 value, right? four, like the top four. So you see, this is an interesting problem. Right? Another problem I actually discussed in the, in the book, the first chapter, that's the main thing about this fourth chapter, it's talking about stable marriage. So the problem I discussed like uh, uh, this uh, dating, right? it's a sequential, you focus on one person, but actually in reality, it's, in reality it's much, much difficult. Why is that? Because you're, you, like, you're the one who make a decision, but in reality, the other side can make a decision. Right? And we're talking about society with a multiple people, multiple people. So the matching is like a multiple matching. So multiple matching really means that, uh, suppose in a village you have a 100 girls, 100 boys. How you match this? How you match this one? So what I mean match? So match, you want to keep all of them happy although the happiness is very difficult to define. And in, in real life, how you actually do the matching, right? So everyone think about the, how you actually do the matching. So maybe we have uh, some discussion. <laughs> Before we look at the algorithm. So suppose I gave you this problem, anyone has some kind of idea 
uh, you will solve this kind of problem. Although we haven't defined even the one mean the happiness uh, or something. Just, just think uh, if you have any idea. If anyone want to say some words, or we just continue. <laughs> I mean, my plan of attack would probably be have everyone say you had like 10 people, 10 men, 10 women, have yeah. all the men like list their like list their top three favorites of the men and all the men do the same for the women and then see if there's any overlap. And then like, that's probably a good place to start matching people. Okay. Yeah. That, that's a possible, right? But now the who's deciding the matching. So you, you need a, like a central guy to do the matching, right? So you see, this is an interesting means that whether you have a, a agency to help you to do the matching or you do it uh, individually. Right? So this is one question. I mean, the idea is, is quite good, but it's not the perfect. So what happens if you fail on the top three and then, the, then you go to top four and top, so whether this is efficient or not, right? So that's uh, another, another question. And in fact, the, I, I will tell you this, and surprisingly, there is a distributed solution. Distributed solution means that there is no central, central entity. Means that there is no like a matching agency. But in real life, just imagine in real life, thousands of years, how boys and girls are matching and married. It's totally decentralized. Decentralized, right? So someone propose, then uh, you either accept or reject, or maybe you engage. And believe it or not, people use this algorithm for thousands of years. No one find this algorithm until relatively recent. Actually, the person find this algorithm got the Nobel Prize in economics. Right. So let's first, uh, before we look at this problem, there's actually there's some privacy issue also. And as you mentioned that you want to propose top three. So, why, why I should tell everyone so I like this top three? In reality, you never talk, right? In, in real life, you just, you like someone, you just propose or you start dating. And uh, another challenge is that how can you do it asynchronously? Asynchronous means that like you have a 10 boy, 10 girls, right? Maybe one boy doing very fast, another boy is slow, right? Then how girls make a decision? And should the boy propose to girl or girl propose to boy? <laughs> it's, it's a very interesting thing. So let me just uh, look at this one. And another important thing, not just matching, all right? The very important thing means that uh, you want a marriage to happy, not just happy, but also stable. So we talk about stability, another problem. Because you don't want to have a matching, at the end you divorce. Although we haven't defined uh, what means a uh, stable marriage. Right? So this is a real life problem. So everyone has a internal ranking, internal rank. I focus on internal ranking. It means that it's a private ranking. No one will tell you. So boys will not tell girls who I like most. Girls will not tell who I like most. They keep it private. So you have a, like three boys, three girls. You have a ranking, right? You see that? They were like uh, uh, Amy, Bessa, Claire, number three, right? So it looks like Claire is not very popular in last one, right? And uh, the, in, the, in the women's preference, uh, Zeus is the last one for all. You see the order is kind of random, right? So it's not like a uniform. And how you match this one, right? How you match, right? Obviously you, you expect that uh, the final matching not everyone get their the first choice, right? Like you propose like a top three. If perfect, every, everything is fine, no. But in reality, it's not. Someone you may get the last one, but you want the marriage to be stable. So what means the stable? Okay, stability. And also it should be perfect. Perfect means that if give you 10 girl, 10 boy, eventually everyone will get the marriage. You don't want some left over. And another important thing is a stable. Stable means, unfortunately I don't have a, don't have a board. I, if I switch, it's just too much time consuming. 
So let's just, just define what means unstable. Unstable means that if you have a two pair, or if you have a pair, right, pair, man and woman. So this man and woman is unstable. If a, if a man and woman prefer each other to the current one, uh, way. So what mean, uh, what mean unstable? It means that if you have a man and woman, a boy and girl, if you find two boy and girl, they are not currently married, suppose already married, but you have a, a man and woman not in marriage. And both of them prefer, I see both man and woman prefer each other to their current partners. So that's unstable situation, correct? Like imagine two pair. If the, the man of the first pair like the woman of the second pair better than my wife, then the same thing, the, 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 the woman of the second pair prefer this man than the current husband. Then these two will have basically like marriage or, or swap. So that means it's unstable. So, so that means that they will escape and they form another pair. So you, you get that, right? Means that uh, you, you want a stable. You don't want a, a situation that uh, a man and woman are not in the current pair, but they prefer their current partners. So it looks like this is a very difficult problem. Why this is very difficult? The difficulty means that they give you all this preference. Preference. Preference could be any, any order, any. And you don't even know the preference. You could have any kind of preference. Can there exist a matching? Matching, perfect matching, such that there is no unstable pair. I mean, their marriage just stay there although may not be the happiest, but it's stable. Okay. Any question before we discuss the solution? This is a very classical problem, like probably one of the most beautiful algos in the world called stable matching. The more challenging thing is that even there exists one, how can you find, how can you find the matching in reality? Surprisingly, believe it or not, if you go to any culture, all the culture follow this kind of protocol, you, you get a stable matching. Okay, so let's just look at the one a very simple example. Suppose you have this kind of preference, right? You see preference, this is a boy and a girl. The darker one really means that it's a matching, current matching. So they will match with Claire, right? Yanim with Bursa, Zeus with Anne. They ask whether uh, this is stable. Okay, so the other table is just opposite, the same. It's a clear match with uh, Xavier. Right? So this really means that Xavier and Claire, uh, Claire is the uh, last choice. Right? But in reality, it's not uh, stable. Why is this not stable? We look at the blue color, blue color, blue color. See, Xavier married with a Barca, and the Barca, uh, yeah. Say, they will marry with, wait, wait. Oh, sorry. They will marry with a Claire. But in Xavier's mind, the boss rank higher than the Claire, right? So he prefer boss than Claire. But let's look at the Claire. Oh, oh sorry, boss. Yeah, boss. In Barca's uh, preference, Xavier is the best one better than the current partner, Yanni. See, that's the problem of Barca and uh, Xavier because they prefer each other than their current partner. So that's called unstable marriage. Means that if you do that kind of pairing, then it's not good, okay? Let's uh, look at uh, another possible pairing. See, now Zeus pair with uh, Claire, although it's not very happy, get the last one and Claire get uh, Claire get uh, Zeus, also the last one, okay? Least favorite, just say hook up. Right? Obviously there's no way for them to, to swap, right? 
So same thing you can you can see that this is stable. Now the question is that in reality, how can you find the stable matching? So I, I'll skip this one. Let's just look at this, the algorithm. So that's uh, called Gale Shuffley's algorithm. It was proposed in 1962, long time ago, almost 20, uh, 60 years ago. But he's more recently got the, the Nobel Prize. The initial people don't realize. Uh, so this algorithm really followed like a traditional approach, most traditional. And this also just a refresh your memory how you read this um, pseudocode. It's very simple, just like English. You have a while, if, else, then, right? So it's very easy to read. So when you submit your homework, you should follow this rule. So this really means that uh, the protocol is, is this one. This is called the main initiate. So in reality, likely this one means a man initiate the, the dating. Men will go for the first one in the preference, the first woman, right? And then the first one means that if, if a man is free, means that if you already find the date, you should not date another person. And uh, you have not proposed to every woman means that uh, you still have a, you should continue, right? Then choose, uh, to choose the, so basically the man to choose the first woman on the list to whom he has not proposed. So if it's initial one, he proposed the best one. If the woman is a free, is a free. So you assign man to the woman. And we call this engage. Oh, this word's very important, engage. Why women uh, just engage, not just say yes or no? Because you have to be fair to the woman because the man proposed you may not be the best person in her list, right? But she at the same time does not want to give, uh, uh, give up a chance because otherwise you may not get a pair. So just why it's engaged. So later, if there's a better man proposed, you can swap, you can give up the current engaged one. So that's the, the protocol. So they look like a real life, right? right. So if it's a, uh, if a woman is free, means that uh, if no one proposes, I always just say engage, okay, engage. What happens if a woman is engaged? Then she will compare your quality against uh, the current one. If you're better than the current one, just assign, matching, engage, another engage. Then set the other man free. Then, the, and that's it, right? Obviously, if a woman's already, uh, married obviously she just simply reject you so that means you don't have to do the synchronous asynchronous right? now you may ask uh, this woman to engage how long do you take engage you can have a long period or small period it's up to you okay this is so it could be a one year half year so now the question is that what happened to the men get uh, rejected Maybe engage initially, reject it. Then he will continue the list, his list, go to the next one. So the, the, the pattern is always this, men always initiate, woman is just waiting. But woman will accept, always accept the first one proposed as engaged and waiting. Wait here until either no one proposed, then you marry, or you find a better one, then you swap. And the guy gets rejected, then continue. Okay, so is that like a very fair, like a practical solution? Any question? Any question about that? Looks like the algorithm very simple, right? But the great things about this is this algorithm is very efficient and you get a stable result. I guarantee that all the pair, man and woman will get the pair. No one will be single. Everyone will, will marry. That's really surprising me, right? So now the question is how you prove this one? That's the, the main things about our class. Right? So maybe we'll skip uh, this uh, before we do that. And you look at this one, uh, but this related to like a, who has a preference means that it's it's to men's advantage or for the woman's advantage. Some people say, oh, maybe it's it's good for the woman. 
because the woman they already decide the final pairing. But some people say maybe woman is better or man is better because men propose. So let's look at some observation. Men propose a woman in a decreasing order of preference. So you always pick the best one. But once a woman is matched, it never become unmatched. She only trade up. That's why women will never get single status if there is one, one, one proposed. So that's a very important protocol. And the algorithm will terminate after at the most n square iteration. That's very simple because you have n men and n women. Each possible pair is n square, right? So that's why the complexity of this algorithm is n square. By the way, I never mentioned about whether this algorithm is parallel or sequential. In reality, what's the real life? Real life is not sequential, right? In a village, you have a hundred boy, hundred girls. They can date at the same time. No synchronization. They can do all this at the same time, parallel or distributed, right? But at the end, at the end, maybe whatever the period of time, everyone get married and stable. So how you prove that? First, all men and women will get married, means matched. So how you prove this one? Although the detail probably you have to look at slides. I just quickly gave, you prove by contradiction. So suppose uh, Zeus is not matched upon termination of the algorithm, it means that you check all the girls, you get all rejected. So if a one guy get rejected, there must be another woman who's not matched, right? You have a 100 boy, 100 girl. Suppose Amy is the one that uh, not matched in the, upon termination. Then the reason based on the observation too means that Amy never proposed, was never proposed. Otherwise, based on the rule, once a woman get proposed, always engaged, right? So Amy is never proposed. But then Zeus proposed to everyone since you end up unmatched. There is a contradiction because Zeus said that not match, he has to propose to everyone. But Amy is never, no, no one get proposed and never get proposed. So that's a contradiction. So it's a very elegant proof. Okay, so this is a, a simple one, so how you get. And there's another proof, which is uh, related to called unstable pair. There's no unstable pair. That's a, maybe looks like uh, more difficult. So again, you can prove by contradiction. Suppose A and Z are unstable pair. So each prefer each other's partner, right? Means that uh, each prefer, each uh, actually means that A and Z, A and Z prefer each other than the current partner. Then you have two cases, whether Z ever proposed to A or Z has proposed to A. Then for both cases, you reach a contradiction. Right? So this again, you prove by contradiction. Suppose Z never proposed to A. Never propose A means that, uh, means what? Boys always propose the favorite girl first, right? So that means Z prefers his current partner than A, which is, uh, should be a stable one, right? I mean, current partner better than A. So this is a contradiction. Main proposing a decreasing order. Then another one, suppose A proposes, Z proposed A. So at a certain stage, but A reject the Z, right? You propose uh, A, you reject. Why, why you reject? The reason is that you prefer the current partner than Z. Again, this is a contradiction. So based on these two contradictions, you say that any, you will never have an unstable pair, okay? So the detail, you can look at that. So this is very elegant proof, uh, Gail Shapley's uh, matching algorithm. So oh, there are many property probably I'm not going to go through this. Uh, first of all, this in implementation very efficient. The answer is yes, it's n square, right? And uh, there are other question. We see the stable matching. Is this the only one? And the answer is no. Actually, there are many stable matching. The GS matching, Gail Shaffley's algorithm, just find one of them. 
actually that one is preferred the boy, give a preference to boy. I mean, boy has an advantage, okay? And I'm not going to go through all this detail. So the implementation complexity is n square. And uh, so what you do, this is a, we already learned like data structures. So you have an array of wife and husband and you do matching, right? So this, this is very easy. I'm not going to go through this. Then uh, you may use array to put your preference, number one, number two. You put your number. Number means that the suppose boy and girl has a, a label, right? So you prefer eight is a, a girl's label. Then you just, uh, boy just proposed by the inverse order of preference, decreasing order. So that's why you have inverse preference order. So this part, I'm not going to go through that. And uh, so this is just previous question, probably don't really, in, in fact, like this example, you have a two stable matching, two stable matching. So another question is that if you have a two stable matching, which is better? Again, it's whether it's preferred as a give a boy as a preference or girl's preference, or maybe mix. Okay, so it turned out the uh, Gale Shaffley's algorithm is a boy optimal assignment. I mean, this is the main optimal assignment. So it's a little bit unfair to girls. Means boy has advantage. Now you may ask, can we design a girl optimal assignment? The answer is obvious is yes. We just swap the rule of a boy and girl, right? So let girl propose. You can do that, right? So I'm not going to prove this one. You can just look at this. This algorithm is the main optimal. But you can do is that, uh, uh, oh, this, this is just a summary. Stable matching, you have a boy and girl, but it's main optimal. But you can swap, uh, exchange the rule of more boy and girl, then you have a girl or woman optimal one. Then you may ask uh, this question is, can we do something in between? Means that uh, not a boy optimal, girl optimal, something maybe average the same. In reality, it's not. That's also surprising. Whether you cannot have a boy, some boys propose, some girl propose at the same time, then you may not get a stable matching. So this one uh, is beyond the scope. You can spend your lifetime to study all this. Actually, you have a very sick book talking about stable marriage problem. Right? So just give you some favor about this, uh, this problem. I think I, I covered too much in the first one and still haven't finished. Let's take a break and we will come back uh, at the seven o'clock. Okay.
Okay, let's uh, get started. Everyone's here. Okay, so I'm, we're a little bit uh, behind schedule, but uh, let me first finish this chapter, then ask a question. Uh, about the two problems, celebrity problem, and another one is a runner-up problem to see if anyone has some idea. Let's uh, just uh, look at some extension. So whenever we see a problem, we look at some extension. The first problem is called the stable roommate problem, or put it uh, not politically correct, as a single gender matching problem. So stable roommate means that if you go to college, right? So you're going to find your roommate. Suppose now the difference is that instead of boy and girl matching, you have a same gender, same gender. So you have a 100 boy. And imagine that you have 100 boys that each has a preference, same preference. Now the question is, if there exists a stable matching, and uh, you guess maybe, oh, since the marriage, you can have a stable uh, matching, then the roommate matching is also should, should exist. The answer is unfortunately no. You can always find a case where stable matching never exists. So how does this happen? So I think the best way is to show an example. So now just imagine this is a roommate, right? roommate problem. Let me see if I find that. Uh... Okay, so this is the example. So stable roommate. So you have, uh, uh, you say 100 people, right? Ends of 50. Each person rank as a one from one to well, whatever, 99. Assign roommate pair so that no unstable pair. In fact, there is no, uh, like this kind of preference. Means Adam, Bob, Chris, and Doofus. So A, B, C, D. So this is a ranking. Each person has their own ranking. I prefer this over that. Then uh, let's look at all the possible matching. As a possible matching, that uh, that's the one. If A with a B, A with C, A with a D, right? So that's the matching. And look at all the possible three cases. If, if you match A and B, C and D, then BCH is unstable because B prefers C. See, B prefers C, then A, right? And C prefer, C, C prefer B, then the current matching D. So BC is unstable. If you have another matching, AC and then the other one BD, AB becomes unstable. And this is the another one. If, if you match A and D, B and C, then AC become a stable. Why AC is not stable? Before, because if you look at the A, right, C rank before D. So I don't like the, my current partner. And if you look at the C. And C in the, another room, C prefer A than current partner B. Then this AC will hook up, say, I want, we two want to stay together. So you understand? They become unstable, just like a marriage. Okay, so this is a, so you, you can also imagine like a marriage with only single gender. That's, that's also. Now let's look at other extensions, more interesting. And again, all this is a practical problem. College admission program. That's also called multiple matching. Right. And uh, so I'm not going to go through this detail is just imagine that uh, each person uh, uh, applied the university. So you have like a preference, A, B, C, D like a Harvard, MIT, whatever, Duke, and so on, right? Or local temple and other. Then the difference is that uh, each university can accept multiple students. 
Do you see that? That's a multiple matching. So it's a college admission, just like a stable ma marriage, but it's a special case. Hospital admission program, matching residents to a hospital. That's a very realistic. Like when you go to a medical school, after that, you need to find a residence, right? So residence is like a matching. So you apply to several hospital, and then the hospital, based on your record, they rank their up top one. Then how can you find this kind of stable matching? And it turned out this is actually a very difficult problem, right? like a college admission. So do you need some kind of synchronization, especially in the hospital, like admission program. Right? So what's the difference if you, if you're residents here, you know, like a college admission, you have some kind of period and you almost similar time. But for the hospital, like I go to medical school and all that, all synchronous means that they announce exactly the same time. Right. So that's the same thing, right? I mean, not going to go through the detail is that you have X and Y, your applicants X, hospital is Y, is if unstable, if X prefer Y to the assigned hospital. And that hospital also prefer X, then one of its current admitted students, then you can do a swap, right? So that means it's unstable. So this is a situation like X, I like, uh, for example, Temple University. Right? Prefer Temple than to my current uh, uh, Drexel. And Drexel also look at uh, my record and say, oh, your, your record is better than one of the current admitted students. So then it's not stable, I should admit you, since you prefer me than the Drexel. So that's mean unstable pair, right? So then, then that's the, uh, the problem. So there are lots of interesting uh, similar things. Uh, residence is the same. But I want to look at some other, other uh, uh, extension, uh, one extension called couple. Uh, this is uh, uh, very interesting. The reason is that I actually relate to my daughters. My, my old daughter and my son-in-law both are the doctor. So when they apply, they want to go to the same hospital. Now this is difficult. What happened if two candidates was ranked differently? Maybe a hospital prefer one person over maybe rank very high, the other person not, not rank very high. So actually this variation, uh, variance number four, there's no good solution, right? So that's actually very hard. So I'm not going to go through the, this detail. Means the residence assignment for special cases is very difficult, especially for the couple. And there are other things. For example, certain hospital is a hot, means that they want to go to, for example, uh, UPAM hospital, because in the city, the life quality is good. Maybe, maybe other places uh, like in the rural area, like uh, Geisinger is too, too rural area. So no one goes there. Then what happened, uh, like a hospital over there cannot get enough residents. So how can you solve those kind of problems, right? So the detail, I'm not going to go through this, but there is a nice software actually really used in the medical field called National Residence Matching Program. It was originally used after World War II, right? So it just, you, you, you match all this residence, right? And they solve the problem of rural hospital dilemma. And uh, not going to go through this. If you're interested, you want to do research, you want to do a master or PhD dissertation, uh, you, can, you can look into this detail. And finally, I want to talk about some of the other things, but this is a little beyond the scope. So imagine this, you have a, like a futuristic uh, marriage. Something's missing there, the one page. Oh yeah, stable marriage. So imagine you have a uh, multiple genders. So what mean multiple gender? Right now we have only two genders, right? Male and female. What happened in the future, you have a uh, multiple genders. How you come up with this traditional marriage? But it's still bi a binary. 
And also you can imagine you have a futuristic marriage where a family with not just two partner, but K partner. So are there any stable marriage? Right? So obviously, well, let's first define what means multiple gender. So this is some of the news. Um, this actually when I taught this two years ago, these are the newspaper. For example, Germany introduced a third gender for people who identify as intersex. And in New York City, birth certificate, you get a gender neutral option. It means that when you have a baby, you can pick a neutral option. It means that not just girl and boy, and you can have a neutral, third one. And you know that this is a controversial bathroom problem, right? So actually there's a survey and uh, in the country, it says that uh, how you decide which bathroom you should go, boy and girl, 43% uh, consider biological sex on their birth certificate. Birth certificate determine where the boy go, then you go there. And the other one is gender which you identify. They identify which gender, right? not based on birth certificate. And there's a 16% that is just undecided. So this, I mean, is a little bit controversial, but just say that now this open society, you may have like a third gender. Now the question is that, uh, suppose you have a, like a three group, not Stable marriage is a two group, right? It's called by Python graph, you know, graph. Suppose you have a three group, another group, we just call this undecided, right? Suppose marriages have a man, woman, they'll be undecided. You can just pick any two. You can find a one person for man and a woman, the traditional or man unidentified or unidentified with a woman and all that. So there is a theorem I, I come up and uh, unfortunately, if K is uh, larger than two, means that if it's traditional one, man, woman, if it's beyond that, you can always find a preference where stable matching is not possible. Right? So this is kind of, but not too surprised. It's like a single gender, you may not get a stable matching. Right? So the proof I will skip because I'm going to assign maybe one of the homework asks you to prove something. Right? So I'm not going to, go through this detail. And you can even extend, you, you use your imagination. Imagine you have a, in future you have a K group, K group. So it's not just male and female. You have another unidentified. When you form family, you pick a one person from each group, right? So like this is three group. So family with three person. And then the, can you extend uh, this uh, 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 stable marriage to a family with a three person. Right? Obviously each group have a preference order against the other group. For example, man has a ranking for all the women, right? like a traditional one. And also man has a ranking of all the unidentified one group. So you have each group, you have a ranking. Right? But uh, if you want to divorce unstable, the situation is a little bit complex. Really means that if you want to do this kind of swap, all the members should uh, get you need to get the consent from the, all the other member, right? Because a marriage is not a two person, now it's a three person, okay persons, right? So I'm not going to go through detail. If you really want to know some of this, I have a paper, you can read this paper. Right? So there's all kinds of theorem, how you come up with matching. Right? So this be on the school. Now, before we uh, discuss uh, the next one, so I want to have some discussion about the problem I give you. Anyone thought about this? And uh, give me uh, some kind of answer. Let's start with a run up. Anyone come up with some solution? Like you have a eight team, right? Eight uh, teams, so you want to have a elimination. I think, I think I have an answer for it. Oh, okay, so what's your answer? Uh, what I came up with is what you would have um, N, so there's N teams. Uh, the minimum number of games to find the runner up would be every team that directly played the champion and lost. You would then have them all play each other in a separate bracket to find the second place team. Yeah. Uh, Great. So it's N plus log base two of N yeah, minus yeah, yeah. two. Yeah, it's a correct. It's correct. So the, the key thing is that. Uh, because any team that lost other than champion cannot be the second one. 
So you only need to select the one who have a direct competition with the champion team. So how many along this line is the log n, right? One branch. So you just amount this uh, a team, you have a match. So it's a log n. So it's n log n. Great. So your name is uh, uh, Ganon? Yeah, yeah, Ganon. Yeah, Ganon. Okay. So you kind of some kind of bonus. Uh, at the end, suppose your final grade is A minus. So I was thinking about to raise your one to A. Okay, so this is good. How about the first one? This is maybe a little more difficult. Uh, what's the best algorithm to select or quickly? Just like a, uh, we have a 12 or 13 students. I think I think I came up with a pro with a solution. Okay, great. So <laughs> what's the solution? Um, with every operation, we can exclude one person. Um, to be sure that he's not the celebrity with every with every operation uh, performed. Um, uh, yeah, uh, maybe a brief explanation why every operation you can eliminate one person. Yeah. A, um, ask B, do you know B, right? Yes, yes. If A knows B, then, then we know for sure that A is not a celebrity. Yeah, that's good. So A can be eliminated. Yes. Uh, what, what's the other option? What's the other? Yes, yes. if A doesn't know B, then B can be eliminated. Yeah, B cannot be celebrity. Yes, exactly. So with every operation, we can exclude one uh, one person. So um, we just need to perform n um, n operations, I think, or n minus one operations to just eliminate all of the people, but the celebrity if there is one. Okay, uh, you're almost there, but it's not complete. Now, the, my question is: the last one who survived, is he or she is really a celebrity or not? Um, by performing this algorithm, the last one that we reach. Um, be careful, uh, be careful. Think about this. The last one survive, right? Mm -hmm. Whether he is a celebrity or not. Um, <laughs> you only eliminate other people. Yes. You have not really tested him extensively. Uh, um, we just stick with one of the people. No, no, my, we, my question is just ask whether there exists a celebrity or not, right? Yes. So you have to give me a very clear answer. Yes. No yes. one is a celebrity, is a no one celebrity. Or yeah. if there is a celebrity, just one celebrity. Yeah. Um, so the algorithm works as follows. We stick with one person. We check if they are the celebrity or not, if he is the celebrity or not, by asking um, if this person knows B, if this person knows C, if this person knows D, until um, we figure out that he is not the celebrity. Until then, um, uh, we could have excluded already a number of the uh, people. No, no, that, that's the first round you already mentioned. Uh, yeah. After n minus one, you eliminate all of them except one. Yes. One, one survived. Now my question is that your algorithm end here or not? Um, we Can have you to really this tell one? this one person is a celebrity or not celebrity? Yeah, we have to check this one with, with all of the other people. Yeah, uh, but yes. how you check? Um, by asking all of the people one more time. Yeah, right? one more time against him. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so I still give you a full point, right? So it's very interesting. So it's two times n minus one. Yeah. First, eliminate all the ones who are not a celebrity, n minus one. Then this person left, you still need to check whether he is celebrity or not celebrity. Yes. So you need to ask everyone to see whether you know this person. Unless all of them know him, he's celebrity. Otherwise, he's not celebrity. Yes. And this is the most efficient algorithm, is 2n minus 1. OK, well, very good. So we solved these two problems. And uh, it's, uh, it's uh, I mean, it's uh, surprising and it's good, right? Because you have only 10 minutes to solve this, uh, this problem. OK, now let's, uh, let's uh, continue. Oh, I, have a, I have a question about the celebrity one. Yeah. Doesn't that solution assume that if there was a celebrity, you picked like that A was a celebrity? No. So that because the solution sounds like whatever person you pick, it doesn't doesn't matter. assumes they're the celebrity. Like no, what happens no. if you don't pick the celebrity? How do you still find that there yeah, is? Yeah, you can still find it because the first round you randomly pick a two person. So A ask A A does A know B? If A knows B, that means A cannot be celebrity, right? So you can eliminate A, but you you eliminate A. If A doesn't know B. 
So you have a two choices. You either eliminate A, you eliminate B as a celebrity. So it doesn't matter. It depends on the answer of A. If A knows B, then the A cannot be a celebrity. If A doesn't know B, B cannot be a celebrity. So you just eliminate. Okay, that makes sense. Which pair Thank you, you. you select. Is it correct, right? Towards the end, you only one guy left. But this guy, you need to still verify whether he's celebrity or not celebrity. So it's a very interesting algorithm. Looks like very simple, but if you think carefully, it's... Okay, now let's uh, move on to the second chapter. And uh, again, for this second chapter, uh, I assume most of you know this material, so I do it very fast. Uh, uh, if you want to take a look uh, after class, you can, because this is all the material you learned from the... So basically about the time complexity, although later we will talk about space complexity. Time complexity means how many operations, right? Like a celebrity, how many matches? But sometimes you have to use a lot of space, memory space, but we, here we don't deal with memory space. Uh, so this is the thing we probably don't need to talk too much. So basically it's a, it's a kind of mathematical analysis. Uh, you want to design some kind of algorithm where the input size double and your slowdown is kind of uh, by some kind of constant factor of C. For example, if you get uh, some kind of uh, uh, complexity uh, uh, polynomial, for example, C n to the power of D, D could be square. Right, like a uh, 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 stable matching is B D n square, but then we say that uh, if you set the C as two D, you see the the bottom part, right? Then then the, the whole thing is uh, if you double the n, then you you just increase by a C factor of C, so that that's what it means, right? So that means the key thing is a polynomial, so you have n could be n square, n cube or log in and so on. And another thing you have to remember when we deal with this uh, complexity, we look at the worst case. Uh, the reason that it's relatively easy to handle worst case, because sometimes to calculate average is much more time consuming. Because sometimes you run faster, sometimes you run slow, you just look at the worst case. But you have to be very careful because in the theoretical community, they focus on the worst case. But what happens if worst case really occur? On the average case could be quite good. Worst case is pretty bad. So which algorithm is better? So you have to be careful. One good example is a quick sort. Right? Everyone knows that quick sort, worst case is n square. The reason is that if you pick the, the, the reference point to the extreme or minimum and the maximum, then you cannot split the, the array in the half. You want to find like an average is like half, then you can do recursive uh, solution very quick and log in. But uh, in worst case could be very bad. But in reality, quicksort is one of the fastest uh, sorting algorithm, sequential algorithm. So although in theory, we focus on the worst case analysis, but in reality, sometimes average is important, okay? But throughout the class, when we talk about complexity, we just look at the worst case. And uh, so I think I need to skip this one. This is not right. So this is very important. Remember at the beginning of the class, I mentioned that uh, some students say, I can program, I can code, even the algorithm is not efficient, uh, uh, very fast, it's okay because computer now is very fast. This gave you a real case analysis. And very important that uh, this diagram is uh, really important. So this uh, uh, column is a complexity n. Suppose algorithm n, right? Suppose uh, means that you select the maximum element, n operation. n log n, like a sorting, n log n. n square, for example, worst case, uh, quick sort, or like a stable matching, n square. And n cube, there's some other, and we have about 1.5. This is uh, exponential. Right? So now you have a question, which algorithm is better, two uh, n cube or 1.5 n, or two to the power of n, or n factorial, right? So all you need to do is just increase the size of n. You see that from 10 all the way to 1 million. You see, if it's n, it doesn't really matter, computer is very fast, suppose this. 
and it's just one second. All right. So if you have an end log game, it's not too bad, but you can see as you reach one, one million is 20 seconds. But if it's in square, look at this, 12 days, 12 days is really a lot because I ask a student say that they have a deadline for one week or 10 days, so this is a problem. You can see this one is already, right? But if you go to the N cube, this is a lifetime, more than lifetime, right? So 30,000 30, years. And all this is very, very long means that you, you cannot even calculate. Even when we reach N equals uh, 100, it's already 12,000 years of, of explanation, even this, 1.5 for two, this, look at this, okay, forever. So you can see that reducing the complexity is very important. But we only care the so-called asymptotic uh, complexity, it really means that the long, a big one for a big one, you know, how, you, how you compare, right? So this is the key, like 1 million, okay? For small one, you sometimes, you, you really cannot distinguish. So this is very important. It means that you look at the large number. So in general, there are three notation. It right? means asymptotic order of growth. One is called so-called upper bound. The other one is low bound. And one easy way, to, if you're not really good at math, it's easy way upper bound means that, uh, wait. Upper bound means that uh, at most, at most means upper bounded by this. So for example, you have a function, we say this is O, big O means that upper bounded by whatever F function. I mean, for example, F function is N square. So that means upper bounded by N square. So mathematically, it really means there exists a C constant. So it can be, you have a constant, could be any constant. So this Tn is less than Fn multiplied C after n is larger than n zero. So this is very important. n zero means that uh, you may not have satisfied this condition before n zero, but after n zero, it definitely is. So it really means that we only care about the large n, but uh, this diagram, we care about this large n. As long as you can find a point in n such that after that, I'm much, uh, this is much uh, larger than this one. You may have a case like this, compare this one. For small number, this one actually run faster than this one, okay? So that, that's the really meaning. You select an n. After n, this tn is smaller than fn by a constant factor. So same thing for the low bound. Really, you can say that at least, the other, at most, so the only difference is that this is less than equal, this is larger equal. Okay, so if a function that both upper bounded and low bounded, then it's exact. So this is theta means exact. Okay, now let's look at uh, one simple example. Suppose this t function is uh, 23 n square times plus uh, 17 n plus. So once you're familiar, you know that you only care about this, uh, the high order n square. So this is upper bounded by n squared, it's correct. And also it's upper bounded by n cubed. Why this is correct? Because it's less, right, It'd be less. Obviously this is not as precise as say that upper bounded by square. You can even say the uh, uh, upper bounded by n to the power of four, but it's not really accurate. And uh, another one is this at least, this at least n squared n square, so you can just do the simple math. But when you both at most and at least, then it's the same order, right? So it's exact, tight bound, right? So this is not, but that's obvious. So this is just to refresh your memory. It's just simple mathematics. Once you're familiar, it's uh, very easy. If you see a polynomial, you just look at the, the higher term order. That's the bound. So probably I'm not going to go through all these other things as a transitive relation, addictive. Transitive means that if F was upper bounded by G, G is upper bounded by H, then F is upper bounded by H. That's obvious. 
equal F equals G, G equals H, then F equals H, the same. Additivity, if F is uh, upper bounded by H, G is upper by H, add together is also bounded by H. That's very simple. So this actual rule is more important. Uh, just like you see a polynomial, all you need to care is about the high term. This means that just order this. And you don't really care about the coefficient because you have a C, right? So that's not the way. You only care about this term. You don't need to worry about the con uh, con uh, constant. The reason is that we only look at the, the big picture. We don't want to break down to constant stuff, right? The polynomial time, so this is what our whole class is about. We try to find solution with optimal or optimal solution with the polynomial time complexity, which is the order of n to the d. n is imprecise. Remember at the beginning of the class, I mentioned for each problem, I gave you input. Although I didn't say that what kind of input, how you represent input, that's covering the data structure. So next class I will get to uh, review. Where they represent the input as a graph, a tree, stack, queue, or, or so on, right? Or link list. That's uh, sometimes the data structure plays some role where determining the complexity. Right? So that's why we studied the data structure. But we're at a high level. High level means that we care about the algorithm. Data structure plays some role, but it's not as significant as the algorithm itself. And uh, a logarithm, that's very important, log, log, because it grows much slower. And we all know this log uh, operation, right? It has a base A and B is the same. Because log uh, base A N is equivalent log N divided by log A. So it's just constant. Then you can take out the constant, that's why it's the same. So all the other way in the exponential, exponential always runs faster. So that's, I mean, slower. So you try to avoid, logarithm is very fast. Okay, so that's the whole things. Now let's just uh, quickly look at some, uh, some problem. Uh, we, now we have a time, yeah. So we will do a little bit slow, at least you get familiar with the algorithm. What kind of algorithm we, and what's the format of algorithm? Well, that's very simple. Computer maximum. That's very simple. So you have an input. Uh, so suppose you have an array, right? Array, you, what you do is this one. Give you one, two to n. How you find the maximum? You start with the first one. You put the max, you introduce a variable max. Then you start from i equals two. From the second, run all the way to n. So you use this notation. Four, i equals two, two n. Then parenthesis, this is what you do. You compare the elements on this check, compare with the current maximum, this current maximum. So you introduce a, a, a variable called maximum. So if your new element is larger than the current maximum, this current maximum is replaced by AI, right? So you, this iteration after this for loop, the final maximum is the, is the maximum element. So why this is an n complexity? Because you execute this four statement, inside statement close to n time, which is n minus two, right? Or n, n minus one, from two to n, n minus one. This is the first initialization. So it's very important you introduce maximum initialization, then you run from two to n compare with the current maximum, then you always Maximum store the current maximum. Right? So now you're familiar with this kind of a pseudo code. Right? So, so that's why I emphasize you do not a particular language, just pseudo code. This is another way to get familiar with. Uh, you can even the pseudo code you can put this in English, so it doesn't really matter. This is a famous merge sort. Merge sort already means that uh, suppose so it's like a divide and conquer. So, so you, suppose you have a, 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 element, a set of uh, two sorted lists, it means that you already sorted, sorted, like a two classes, right? Two class, two class A and class B. They already, already ranked the students based on the GPA, top student the first one. 
Now, how you combine A and B to a one, one list? It's a sorted list, means the top student, the first, the last student, the lowest GPA is the last one. So it's not like you have to, you, you can't really, uh, you can sort again, but the sort is in log game. You don't need to do that because these two sub list is already sorted. All you need to do is you have a marker at the top. Now you compare the top of A compared with top B. If top A is better than B, you move the top to the merge the result. Then you move the point of A to the right one. They compare the second best of A compared with the best of B. Then depends on result, you either shift the pointer of B right or shift the point of A right, right? So what's the complexity? The complexity is N. Why is that? Or, or, or two N. So N is that uh, the length of each uh, sorted list. The reason is that each time you do a comparison, you shift the pointer right to the one position. So that I mean the pointer position has only two N. You either you run out of for A or you run out of B. Whichever run out first, you actually you should stop. You don't really need to. Right? But in the worst case, they run out at the same time. That's why it's two N. Right? So how you write this algorithm? It's simple. You can see that this algorithm has a pointer I. I is a pointer for A. J is a pointer for B, right? So imagine you have a pointer. Then you compare the first one against uh, A against the B, A and B. So append A to the output list, increment uh, I. So it really means that if A is smaller, means suppose small is better. Right? Then you move the, you shift, you increase I, you shift the pointer to right one spot. If otherwise you shift, uh, you append B, so this is how you rank the students, that's easy. When you should stop, you should stop if a remainder of the list is empty. Either one is empty. Obviously this one does not really, uh, if, yeah, if it's one, oh, sorry. sorry, this is, a, it means that both lists are not empty, you should continue. If one is empty, you just append the remainder of the other one there, you don't need to compare anymore. Whatever the left, for example, there's three students left, that's directly a pen. So that's how you do the comparison. How you prove that? You see the key is how you prove. Because at, after each comparison, the length of output uh, list always increase by one. Since you have only two N elements. So that's why it's two N. But in asymptotic complexity, we just say that order of N, right? So upper bounded by N. And uh, there are many other problems like a divide and conquer, merge, so all quick sort. Right? Quick sort is, is, a, is a good example of quick sort. A merge sort is the same idea. You see, I already, already know the previous one is a, it's a one important step of merge sort. So, for example, you already have a two sorted uh, small list. Now, the question how you get a two small sorted list? Again, it's a divide and conquer. So each sorted list coming from another smaller to sub list, right? So you can start like uh, uh, the tree we already mentioned. Initially, each element is like a sorted list, only one element. Then you merge this two into two. Then two, two, you get a four. Then four, two, four, then eight. So this is how you do this merge, 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 merge. But each merge, you see that's the complexity. Right, the total number of uh, operations is n, no matter how many is n. But the question is how many merge you needed? You already know, it's just like a uh, tournament, tournament, uh, let me elimination, the merge. So you need a log n. So that's always n log n, right? So that's the easy way. So we're not going to go through this uh, uh, heap sort and quick sort, you all know this one. Okay, so we'll skip that. Now let's look at some of the quadratic uh, uh, solution. Again, it's a very simple one. So suppose I give you uh, uh, lots of points, lots of points. 
So give a list of endpoints in the plane. So really means it's a two dimension, X and Y, right? Uh, in reality, suppose you live in uh, New York, uh, Manhattan. So you have a street and avenue. Then uh, you have uh, like a friends, you have N friends. They in a particular spot, 20, 25th Street, 5th Avenue, then 35th Street, 2nd Avenue, and so on. So these are the position. Now you say that, can you find the two friends with the closest? So how you find that? All you need to do is just enumerate all the possible pair. So how many possible pairs, right? Pair means that uh, you have to look at X and Y. So what you need to do is just look at the X and Y, X and Y, the distance. So you need to do, so how many difference in terms of street, 20, 25 to 35 is uh, 10th street, Avenue, right? So Avenue, you know, Fifth Avenue versus Second Avenue, so three, right? Then you do the squares and the square root of first square. You, you know this uh, because it's diagonal position. Then you just uh, look at uh, then for each. So the question is that uh, how you control, right? So you first look at one particular point against all the other one. Then you move the second point, they compare the other one. So, so you have to enumerate in a, in, a, in a special way. So like one against two, one against three, one against N. Another one, another one, two against three, two against four, two against N. Then three against four, three against, right? So that's how you do it. I from one to N. Then you have another round. It's J is I plus one to N. So you have I and J because you have a street and avenue. So you compare. Then you calculate uh, this result. Again, to follow the maximum element, you, you, you introduce a, a variable called minimum. So you only care about one variable, which is minimum. What's the current minimum? You keep track of the current minimum. So again, you can start with the one point is the minimum, then you enumerate all the other one, keep the minimum. Eventually, whenever you find the one better than or smaller than the current minimum, it'll be replaced. At the end, when you run out, run the whole algorithm, then you stop. So how many iteration is n squared, right? So that's, that's simple. And there are some algorithms a cubic time. That's also quite simple. It's numerate all triples, triplets, triples of element. So it's just like a set of disjointness. So set of disjointness. Uh, really I give uh, n sets S1, Sn, each of which is a subset of uh, n, from one to n. <clears throat> is there some pair of these which are disjoint? So what this really mean? You can imagine this. You see, when you see this kind of mathematic expression, try to relate to the real life. You can imagine that these are the students, S1 and SM. And uh, the students' hobby, hobby. Hobby means uh, from one to N. Hobby means uh, one is music, two sports, and some N is art, right? So each student has a subset of a hobby. <coughs> S1 means a student one's hobby. And then SN is student N's hobby. So it's coming from us. It's a subset of one, one to N. <coughs> you ask, are there any two students that don't have a common hobby? Well, that's not too difficult. <coughs> the only thing is that you have to examine any pair of a students, which is already N squared. And then each one, you, for each one, they have a subset. So you have to look at all their hobby. So that's why you have a, like a three loop, right? So that's the that's why how you how you write your pseudocode for each set, then for each other set, then for each element in the set, then you check whether it belongs to that. Right? If it does not, no element belong to that, then you report S and J are disjoint, right? So you can actually you can stop right there. If the question say that only need to find the first one, you just stop there. If they say that you have to find all of them, then you have to exclude all of them, exclude all of them. That's why you get the NQ, right? Because there are possible N square pairs. 
for each pair, you have to look at each uh, hobby. That's why it is in Q. So any questions? Not too difficult, right? Not too difficult. I mean, we are getting a little bit more and more difficult. That's the independent set and dominant set. Uh, looks like uh, very mathematical, but it's not too, too difficult. So let me first read in, uh, given a graph, are there any K nodes such that no two are jointed by edge? And all nodes are not in the set, have the neighbor in the set. So let's first define the, oh, that's a dominant set means all nodes not in the set have a neighbor in the set. So let's first look at the independent set. Independent set really means I give you a graph. For example, like a social network. So you have a friend, right? So you have a connection with a friend. Now I want you to say that uh, somehow in a society, everyone's to be the boss, right? The boss. There's one condition, boss has no neighbor as a boss. Means that you, you and your friends, they're only, so suppose you and you have a group friend, there's only one boss, you cannot have a two boss. Right? Boss means that you dominate the other person. So this is called the independence. Now the question that I gave you a, a social network, what's the maximum size of inde independent set? So let me just re repeat again. Independent set means that in a social network, you want to be a boss, right? What's the maximum size of boss? The only condition for boss is that uh, two boss are never adjacent. They're not, so it means that your friendship set, you're only one person. So how you, I don't know, there's no example. I try to come up right now. Oh, this is nothing there. Or oh, oh, I have to draw a diagram. May not be as good. And probably we, we don't need it. Oh, let, let me, maybe I draw the diagram since we have a time. You see, is that, can I, yeah. Okay. So what you need to do is uh, draw a, a graph. So it doesn't really matter. Like this. Can you see, right? So this is one. So imagine this is a social network. Social network means that you, your friend, friend, this is a friend. So independent set means that you select a set of nodes, but it cannot be a neighbor. Okay, so this is the this is the one. But unfortunately, this this is a so this independent set, independent set. So what's the maximum independent set? Are there any other solution that you can get uh, like the three boss? Uh, for this case, probably is not, right? Or you can just pick this one as independent, but it's not maximum. Uh, yeah, so th this this is one example. But uh, if you if you have another one, is it here? Then independent set, maximum independent set, this, right? Or the solution may not be the unique. You may have uh, several choices. For example, what's the other independent set? It could be this one, this one, and this one, right? So that's, that's the one. So that's the independent set. Dom dominating set is the So how you find out uh, whether there exists a, a, a K node such that no two nodes are adjacent by the edge, right? So that means it's independent set, K nodes. I mean, a silly way to do it means just, you look at any subset, any subset or K nodes, you check if it is independent set or not. Right, it's uh, it's very easy. How you check uh, 
uh, a set is independent, just look at the two elements. If they're adjacent, if they're adjacent, then it's not independent. But now the question is how many subset right, of K? Right? So checking whether independent set or not itself is K square, right? Because you have to pairwise inside. But how you select uh, K elements, that's a typical combinatoric problem, right? Select N out of K. Sorry, select K out of N. I always try to find that. Uh, yeah, it's here. Select K out of N. That's a high school mathematics, N to K, N minus K plus one, K. That's less than N to the power K, K factorial. Right? And then the, that's, that means upper bounded by this number. So this is how many possible set, and for each set you need to perform n square. So this is how you do this uh, calculation, okay. and this is upper bounded by this one. Okay. So so that means its uh, complexity is n to the power of k. So it depends on size of k. If the size of k is a, is a big, then it's a problem, right? If the size of k is a uh, uh, related to n, then it's a problem. For example, the size of n divided by two, there's too much. So that means it, then it's no longer polynomial. If k is very small, like a one or two, then it's relatively easy. Okay, similarly, you can ask other questions, like I give you a graph, what is the maximum size of an independent set? Like what I just mentioned, right? You have lots of independent set. It can be small and large. So this is a little bit more, more expensive. That means that you have to check all the size, right? That's, that's not really difficult, but it's not that efficient. You have to look at all the subset. subset. You record the size of the largest subset independent set. Right? So that's the, that's the one. So I, I, not, I skipped the dominant set concept. So finally, uh, just a quick overview of, uh, there's a, a, in chapter one, it gave a, a very interesting five, five problem at the end. So I let, let's just give a, a quick uh, 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 overview. In fact, this five problem will cover almost all the material in our class, I mean, sample one. The first one called interval schedule. And the really interesting problem, probably already learned in the, one of the data structure class. Suppose like, uh, you know, everyone's so busy every day, right? So many tasks, right? For example, I want to do sports uh, from seven o'clock to eight o'clock. Then I want to do reading from 8.30 to 10 o'clock. Uh, so that means the duration is uh, not really equal, right? So that's why I call interval. But those intervals overlap. For example, I cannot play music at the same time doing homework. But I know the starting time and finish time for each task. But each day you have only from morning seven o'clock to maybe 11 o'clock in the evening. Now the question is how you select a maximum number of non-overlapping activities. It looks like a quite difficult right? because you have a, some a, a task is overlap. You cannot select a task which is overlap. But some task is long, sometimes short. And we only care about, we don't care about long and short. We only say number of tasks or number of activity. We want to maximize number of activity. How difficult is this kind of problem? It turned out this is not a really difficult problem. And there's a greedy solution. You just scan from left to right, so morning till the evening. You only care about the finishing time. So you think about that. But just be careful. Lots of problems looks like a very similar. They turn out the complexity is totally different. And the second problem is called a weighted interval schedule. So you don't really care about the total number, but you care about the weight. For example, doing homework, I put the two weights, weight of two. Uh, uh, reading newspaper, you put the weight of one. So that means homework is more important than the news, reading newspaper. So how can you select a, a set of non-overlapping interview so that you want to maximize your weight? It turned out this problem is much harder than the interval schedule. But there is a solution called dynamic programming. 
So that will be learned in the dynamic program chapter. Now let's look at another problem called the bipartite matching. We already learned the bipartite matching is like a stable marriage problem, right? Bipartite means that you have a girls on left hand side, the boys on right hand side. You want to match a boy against a girl. But let's change a little bit. Suppose a boy has some kind of preference, girl has some preference. They're actually very picky. For boys, boy one to say, I, I just like a three woman particular. Uh, a girl number one, maybe say, I just like the last two guy. Now the problem is that you may not find the matching 100%, but I want to find a maximum matching. A similar problem, like in the class, right? Like me, I can only teach a certain number of classes. So I teach algorithm, distributed system, and some of the architecture and so on. So each professor has a limited number of classes you can teach, but you have all the courses there to be covered. Now the question is that uh, like a chair, right? I was a department chair for many years. So the problem every time, every semester, like a spring semester, how can I match a professor with classes so that uh, all these classes are covered as many as possible Otherwise I have to spend money to hire adjunct professor, right? So this is called the bipartite matching. Surprisingly, this bipartite matching problem can convert it into a network flow problem, which is a very famous algorithm, network flow, maximum flow, invented by a famous professor from Berkeley. Actually, he visited the temple like five years ago. He's a, again, Nobel Prize winner. Oh, not Nobel, the Turing Award winner. And then the independent set we just mentioned. And why I need to mention independent set? You find that the maximum independent set it turned out to be a very hard problem. There's no polynomial solution. That kind of problem we call MP compete. And the many problem we discuss, like interval, interval schedule, weighted interval schedule, bipartite matching, just a special case of independent set. Why is that? And this is very important in the algorithm design. Sometimes two problems looks totally different, but if you do some kind of uh, 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 mapping, you find that these are the same problem. Why interval schedule is basically independent set? It's easy, this is really easy, because you cannot have two activity that overlapping, just like say that independent set, it cannot be neighbor, right? How about the way, uh, how about the bipartite matching, matching boy and girl? You can imagine those matching, you focus on the link, boy and girl. Right? So you want to make sure that each boy, you can have only one link connected to the girl. You can have one boy connect to two girls or one girl connect to two boy. So that's kind of independent, right? So that's independent set problem. But it's a, it's a special case of uh, independent set. Independent set itself is MP hard, MP complete. And no, no good solution, okay? But the special case, you have optimal solution, like an interval schedule, greedy solution. Weighted uh, interval schedule, also have a solution, but a little bit more complex, called dynamic programming. By pattern matching, there's a network flow, a little bit more complex, but still solvable. Okay, and there is another one, which is a really interesting problem, and it's like a related to game. So what, what does game mean? Uh, really, uh, just look at this number, right? This number, 10, 1, 5. Just imagine those are the, those are the residents on the street. So 10 means I have a 10 residents. One means you have one residence. Then you have a two player. Two player means like owner of a restaurant, for example, in Chinatown Noodle, uh, Lanzo Noodle. So you have a two restaurant. They want to open the location, open location. So the restaurant one select one position. Say I'm going to open up a restaurant, for example, at this spot, 15. You see that 15? Then the second restaurant owner say, I'm going to pick another location. Then how you decide how many passengers, how many customer you can attract based on the distance. So if you pick the first restaurant, pick uh, the 15 location, the second restaurant pick at the five, then all the left, left of the 15 will go to the first player. So he will attract, uh, the owner will attract the 10 plus one plus five plus 15. So you get uh, 21 uh, customer. 
the other guy get the rest, right? But obviously, if a first guy pick another location, then the second player can pick another location uh, that can attract the maximum number of a customer based on the distance. So this is a very interesting problem. It turns out this problem called the P space complete. It's harder than the MP complete. So in a nutshell, it really means both are very hard problem. The first problem is hard, but for independent set, it's relatively easy to verify, right? Like I gave you a graph, I gave you a certain point independent, ask it to verify is this uh, independent set. It's easy. I just see where the two points meet each other or neighbor. If not neighbor, that's independent set. But if I ask you this question, can player two guarantee a reward of 20, no matter how player one play? The answer actually is yes. Actually, you can try no matter where, where the first owner of the restaurant owner placed the location, player two can always find another location that can attract more, uh, can attract at least 20, 20 customer. But for the, uh, another, another question, can player two always guarantee a reward of 25 if uh, he's the second one to select the location? In fact, this one is no mean that there's always a strategy for one pick a location, then the, no matter where you uh, to play, you cannot get uh, 25, right? So this kind of problem, like a game, game problem. I don't, I don't know whether we have a time. Maybe I uh, will discuss other interesting problem like uh, playing cards, a game. So you can design some kind of algorithm to solve a game, right? So this is a, it's a very interesting, called competitive facility allocation. Facility allocation is a very famous problem. Uh, so applying many, many field. For example, Amazon. Amazon, you see that why Amazon now can deliver the product very quickly? Because they have lots of uh, factory right, or, or, or storage place. See, so that uh, all the countries covered. So that the maximum distance from the, your home to a nearby facility location is uh, very close. Now the question is that, where you place those facility. So this is called a facility allocation. Same thing is like a restaurant, right? So you want to attract a customer, nearby customer. So where you want to place those uh, facility. Right? So it's a very fascinating, right? there are a bunch of problems we'll, we'll discuss. I think we are run out of time, and, uh, but I, the great thing that we cover almost everything. Uh, if you have a time, just read the chapter one, chapter two, and maybe chapter three, it was graph. Uh, if you're familiar, you just look at my notes. Uh, the notes are just more than the, in the book. Okay, so let's stop here and uh, I will see you. Uh, wait, where should I, how should I uh, stop recording?